Local talk radio shows, Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7 FM, WFBT, Carolina Beach. The information on this program is intended to share the experiences others have had in battling addiction and to let you know there is hope to recover, no matter how bad things may seem. Please do not change any program you are on, especially if under medical supervision, without the approval of your doctor, counselor, or other professional treatment. Good evening. Welcome to Recovering Hope. My name is Mark Markley, and it is a pleasure, as usual, to be with you again uh, this Wednesday evening. Uh, This program is intended to help those, or those they know and love, to, to know that there is hope in the battle against drug and alcohol addiction. Last week, and I'll get into some specifics from last, be- last week, but I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Art Kleinschmidt. Art went from pretty much out of school at about eighth grade to getting numerous degrees, one of which is a doctorate in philosophy, ended up working directly under the President of the United States. If that's not a story of hope, then I don't know what is. And again, I'll get to some of the the key points of that interview, as I usually do in the beginning of the program, but this being Easter week, something that I wanted to share personally from some of my uh, devotional time this week. So Easter, what happened? We all heard the story about Jesus being crucified, and it's been told so many times, do we really give it much thought? I've been listening to some sermons lately that describe the gruesome beating he endured before being nailed to a cross. The flesh being torn from his back, tearing at muscle as the leather straps with shards of sharp lead and glass whipped him relentlessly those 39 times. The Romans knew just how far they could go before their victim died. Here is perhaps a new thought. When his disciples were given his body, how did they get the nails out of his hands and feet? As a carpenter, I know it's not easy to remove even small nails when you have the right tools. These were spikes driven through God's arms and legs. Yes, that was God on the cross. All done for the forgiveness of our sins. He simply asks us to appreciate that. May I wish you a truly happy Easter celebration. And then I had another couple of thoughts. Um, And again, folks, this is just just me being me. This is who I am. (laughs) I do see a a relationship between recovery and, and faith, and I hope that you do too. But if you don't, it's okay. Easter's in a few days. I think this is an appropriate message. This came to mind when reading about Peter's denial of Jesus when Jesus was having breakfast on the beach with Peter. Jesus didn't ask Peter for confession for his sin. He asked him for a confession of his love. This somehow made me think of the following scripture. And when you did, and when you did, we see you, I'm sorry. When did we see you sick or in prison And come to you, and the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these brothers or sisters, you did it for me. I don't mean to suggest that those struggling with addiction are, quote, the least of these, as somehow they are worth less than anyone else. However, sadly in our society, and many others, a drug addict 
is often despised like an outcast. When we treat people equally, we'll come to, an under, we'll come to understand that addicts are sick. They have a disease. And they need help. As I mentioned last week, we need to treat diseases from the neck up the same way we treat diseases from the neck down. Like I said, last week we had the, uh, the pleasure of interviewing Art Kleinschmidt. Uh, Art is the former deputy director of the um, White House Drug Policy Council and had some very good words of wisdom uh, to share that I'll just uh, recap some of, the, some of the high points. And my friend uh, Wayne Ray was here last week also, and they both talked about uh, the book Dreamland. Wayne asked Art if he had read the book, and not only did he read the book, but he's had coffee with the author. <laughs> um, I don't know the content of the book, but it, apparently it goes into some of the real nitty-gritty details of drug dealing, what goes on at the border, and um, apparently it's, it's very accurate. Art was surprised how accurate this guy could be, not having been there himself. And again, you know, like I said in the beginning of the show, um, having Dr. Kleinschmidt here last week, such a great story of hope. He was very familiar with the pill mills that Dan Schneider spoke about and helped to break up down in Louisiana uh, in his uh, documentary, um, The Pharmacist. He got himself straightened out, got sober, as he put it, in an Oxford house. Dr. Kleinschmidt got an incredible education. Doctor of, doctor of philosophy, among other degrees, moved up through the ranks and ended up working for President Trump. You think his mom or dad ever thought that that would happen when he was on the streets? Again, he spoke last week about how pretty much dropped out of school or fell out of school like in eighth grade. He didn't talk too much about when he got back, but obviously he got back because the guy's got more degrees than he has room on his wall to put the certificates, I think. But he admits that some of his most useful education came from his intimate knowledge of the streets. This is one of his quotes. Nobody is so sick that they can't recover. You never know what's going on in someone's life that's going to set off that light bulb. Use the talents and resources you have and apply them to your life because we all have them. They come in different packages, different sizes and shapes, and, and, and you know everybody has their own passions. And again, the talents and resources, uh, other causes. This happens to be a personal cause of mine because of how drug addiction affected my family. So this is why I'm doing this. There are a lot of other people that are doing a lot of other great things out there. And regardless of, of how you feel now, if, if you are struggling with addiction or you know somebody that is, um, there's hope. And again, that, that's what we're here to do, to, to share that hope with you. He also stressed the importance of knowing the difference between enabling and helping, and, and helping somebody. And to put it simply, enabling somebody is doing something for someone that they can do themselves. Helping someone is doing something that they can't do themselves. I understand that some of these things sound like cliches, but trust us, they're not. And one thing that he said to me that, that, that really made me feel like I'm on track here is that instilling hope is the number one thing. Some ways that we see as helping, and again, this is art speaking, are incubating the disease. And I think he was speaking about certain cities. I know there are some out in California, whether it's San Francisco, San Diego, is one of those sand cities, I don't know, but, um, you know, where they're making it very easy and comfortable for not only to get clean needles, okay, there's pros and cons on that, but establishing sites where people can safely shoot their drugs. Sometimes they're called shooting ranges. This gets to the point where it may not be harm reduction. And again, I value your opinion. I, I really do. I, I'm learning new things as we go here. I'm fairly new in this, in this field. Uh, if you have an opinion that you'd like to share, one of the best ways is to email me, mark at recoveringhope.org. Uh, my phone number, 
No, that's my old number. Wow, where did that come from? That must have been when I was on the radio 10 years ago. 231. Yes, yeah, they went back a digit. 231-6020. Call, text, or whatever, but please not during the show. You'll, you'll throw me off and I need to focus. <laughs> I have a focus factor. Um, but really, uh, you know, that's one of the differences between it gets back to helping and enabling. You know, I don't know if they're giving them the drugs as well or, you know, buy one, get one free. Come on here, get high. And, you know, it's, it's not good. The, it's good to have Narcan, but, but people are having these parties where it's like a designated driver. Okay, you guys take as much as you want because I got the Narcan here and I'll just, re, I'll just bring you back to life when you die. Not good. Needs more discussion, and we might talk about that with tonight's guest, which is Michael Gray. Um, and back to uh, Art from last week. Um, that the border, in his words, is run very scientifically. You know, it's not like the old days, you know, where the mules and you got to send the guy out, and 48 hours later he'll come back and tell you what's going on. Obviously, they're using all the technology that you and I are using. And it, it's, it's very well run. And it's kind of funny. I had somebody working with me today who was a, a young man in recovery. And I, I mentioned him a, a few weeks ago that um, he has seen, he has been at the border. He's, he's brought drugs across the border. And he has seen with his own eyes all the immigration officers turn the other way as these cars just drive right by. He's seen it himself numerous times. Now, again, some of you are saying, no kidding, Mark. We all know there's corruption. I didn't think it was that obvious and blatant, but it is. And as hard as we fight this battle of drug addiction, with the amount of money that's at stake, it's a tough battle. That doesn't mean that we give up throwing the towel. We've got to keep on going. Um, art is, is anti-decriminalization, and harm reduction can be harmful. Okay, I already said that. But, you know, this, this Portugal model that some people speak of um, – is it good? Is it not good? Well, maybe it was good in Portugal at that time. But with the advent of especially fentanyl now, and again, we're going to learn a lot about that tonight. I hope you can stay tuned because Michael Gray, um, he lost a daughter, and that's what got him on this trajectory. He's very, very knowledgeable. He has a very unique perspective on what he calls the new paradigm. So we're going to take our first break here, folks, and um, hope you can stay tuned and listen to Mr. Gray and if I forget to mention this at the end, next week, uh, a colleague of his, uh, Virginia Krieger, will join us to share her side and to kind of continue on uh, from Michael's um, interview. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. It's time to get something done, and you've done your due diligence to find the best vendor. It's time to say, just do it. Well, there are a few things we need to do from time to time, and that is to move. Whether it's moving that overstuffed garage to climate-controlled storage or moving across the nation, the company to choose is Just Move It Moving and Storage. Stetson Strickland, owner and founder of Just Move It, takes pride in his work and is hands-on with every move and offers full 100% car plant service where you pack and they carry Junk removal, site cleanups, if it involves moving things, this is your one-stop company. They also give back to the community. Unwanted furniture goes into storage, and every month they donate it to those in need in the community. So, if you're ready to make that move or just get a quote, Just Move It can be reached at 910-795-7658 or on the web at movingcompanywilmingtonnc.com. Just call them. Besides my involvement in product recovery, I'm also in the construction business. I say that to say this. When we have tropical storms or hurricanes, the real hard, difficult, expensive, and dangerous work is usually the result of trees falling on homes or other personal property. Hurricane season is not the only time to get prepared for this. As a matter of fact, it's before and after hurricane season that you need to get prepared. My son Chris started his tree business called Climb Pro Expert Tree Care after Hurricane Florence. Chris has all the equipment and manpower to take on even the most challenging jobs. With over 20 years of combined experience, Climb Pro LLC can safely remove any unwanted hazardous trees from your property. They also offer tree pruning, elevation, deadwood removal, and other expert tree care services. Don't wait until you have a tree emergency. 
Visit climbpro.com, that's climb with a K. Check them out on Facebook or call Chris Markley at 910-540-5249. Mention this ad for a 10% discount. Some new tunes. I didn't recognize them. Welcome back to Recovering Hope. My name is Mark Markley, and thank you for tuning in here this evening. And again, just as a reminder, we are here to share resources and hope if you or someone you know or love is, is struggling with addiction or other issues, as we are going to learn a lot more about uh, this evening. Good evening, Michael. Good evening, Mark. How are you today? Oh, boy. It's been one of those days, but... It's kind of like when you're going on vacation. You know, you can do what you do. When you get on that plane, you're done. So here I am <laughs> putting, putting the day right. behind me, and it's, it's been a, a crazy one. But um, how was your day? Oh, my day was fine. You know, just uh, glad to come here and talk about this problem again with you and kind of have a little more time to get through some of the issues. Yes. Um, yeah. And I, I did get your outline. Um, there's a lot of information here, so I can – you know, kind of read along here, but why don't you just give us a, a, a short reintroduction of yourself and, and then we can just start moving on down. Sure thing. Um, first, I just started off the top. You talked about uh, Sam Quinones and having coffee with the author, which I have myself done oh, yeah? on a couple of occasions. Uh-huh. Yes, and um, <clears throat> that book, it, I couldn't recommend it. Uh, uh, I, I would recommend it highly. Okay. Uh, if you really want to know the foundation of this problem and how it really mm-hmm. got a grip in our country, mm-hmm. uh, I would say that's a great book to read to understand all the background. What it really does is set us up for the fentanyl crisis. Yeah. He talks, he goes all the way back to the Purdue Pharma and the origins of OxyContin and how it created this, this sort of vectoring of the opioid crisis into mm-hmm. new populations. Mm-hmm. But what I'm going to talk about is a new paradigm where fentanyl acted as a vector of death into the new par- uh, population. So, um, well put. Yeah. So in a sense, you know, you know, Sam's book describes how, how heroin, or, or let's just call it opioid, mm-hmm. found its way into these new populations and got a lot of addiction happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was that was all well and good until fentanyl came along and then started killing those new populations in a way that had never before been killed, and the numbers right. continued continued to become worse and worse and worse. I'll start off by saying, um, as a way of introduction and making that comparison, but also I was on a call just yesterday with the medical examiner of a <clears throat> of a county in California, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and we're talking about numbers of death by fentanyl. Mm-hmm. This year, 2020 surpassed the years 2014 through 2019 combined. Wow. Uh, the year 2020 surpassed those years combined. Whoa. 2021 right now is plotting out to double that number again. Whoa. Uh, so it's, it's just, I mean, we're talking about a 200% increase. Mm. Uh, year on year, and that's a, a fairly uh, typical example of what's going on out there. And, um, you know, this is, so when I talk about death, I really talk about the death numbers, and that's where the fentanyl paradigm really, really has taken its hold, mm-hmm. is, is taking this problem that had been expanding and had been deepening and really, ex- and, and really exporting the death uh, into all new populations. So yes. that's what I mean by the new paradigm. Yeah, and you throw and COVID into the equation, and it sure. yeah, makes it more off the charts, yeah. Yeah, and, and so what's going to happen, and, and, and actually that's, a, that's actually a, a, a good point to make, Mark, and that mm-hmm. might be a really good point for me to walk into this paradigm discussion because uh-huh. what COVID has done is it has increased drug use at every level, right? It's made everybody a little more depressed, a little more uptight. Right, right. You know, they're looking for some kind of an escape. Mm-hmm. So that means, you know, addicts are going to do more and heavy users are going to do more and right. light users are going to do more than light and mm-hmm. kids who don't use are going to start using. Yes. And with fentanyl 
infecting this problem, the, 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 this this um, this problem all the way down through. Mm-hmm. The, many of those people are going to die, and and yeah. and so where COVID would have made the drug use problem worse, traditionally in the new paradigm of fentanyl, it's going to make it significantly more deadly. Right. And so the whole message of the pe- fentanyl paradigm is death. It's all about death. Mm-hmm. So if I go into that paradigm and what it means, let me tell you about how I came to it. Yes. So as you know, my daughter passed away on January 11th of 2018. I got the call sitting right where I'm sitting right now in my home office at 6.19 p.m. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were quite shocked to get a call that our daughter died mm. in the opioid problem. Yeah, I'm my sure. daughter was not a drug user. She was not an addict. Mm-hmm. Uh, my daughter had a, an acute mental health problem, a, a borderline personality disorder, quite mm-hmm. quite uh, severe. Mm-hmm. And she was self-medicating, as many people with mental illness do. I mean, you know, yeah. the, she, she didn't like the meds that her that her psychiatrist, this new psychiatrist, was recommending, who was who was grossly incompetent, as as so many are. And so she didn't trust what he said, so she went on the street to get something to do what she called turn off her brain. She would hit mm-hmm. these manic states, and she would want to knock herself down. Mm-hmm. So I guess he was, he must not have given her her benzo, so she went on the street to get something. And she got something that prior to 2013 would have been fine. Yeah. But now in the year of fentanyl, she got herself a bag of fentanyl on bones to her, and she was killed instantly. <laughs> wow. Man, so when I got that call, thank you so much. Mm. When I got that call that she passed away from Oh, from a drug overdose, and I'm saying, what in the world? Right. So beyond our shock and our grief and our intense sadness, and anybody, if we have any bereaved parents listening to this call, they'll know it's a, it's a unique, unique psychological journey you go through, and I'm still going through it. Of course, it's only three and a half years. Yeah, I can't um, imagine. But as, you, when I was, as I was going through it, on top of that, we were trying to make sense of what happened. How did she die in the drug crisis? Mm. So I started to look at that and think about it, and I got back the tox report. And uh, right away, um, in the tox, in the in the uh, the initial year analysis, they did there was it said one thing, and then the tox screening, which took into account her blood, was a completely different reading. And I began to put all of that together and into a story about this fentanyl problem. She died of of, uh, of fentanyl toxicity. Mm-hmm. That was the cause of death. The manner of death was accidental, strangely enough. Right. Um, so we try to make sense of how it is this happened and why she died. And, and over the course of time, I would realize that this fentanyl was kind of a different, a different animal, wasn't it? Mm. This, this, this quote-unquote drug problem, this opioid problem, that I probably still had lingering prejudicial ideas from what I learned of heroin back in the 1970s when yeah. I was a kid. Right? Yeah, we all did. And what did yep. we learn? Yep. Yeah, we learned that this stuff is so bad. First of all, anyone who takes it is a, you know, is a criminal and a, mm-hmm. and a degenerate and everything else. Right. And by the way, this stuff is so toxic and so so addictive that man, hear the name three times, you're an addict, right? I mean, yeah. get in the presence of it, you're done for. You mm-hmm. know, Skid Row tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Well, we were we were given all of that sort of crazy over the top information because it scared us to death, didn't it? Right. And so we were scared of this stuff. So I'm still having the hangover of my of my understanding of that from the 70s when my beautiful sorority girl, you know, wonderful, open, loving, happy daughter dies Mm. in this Mm. crisis, right? What the heck? Right. Well, over time, I would start to understand something, Mark. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a background. I I work in scientific instrumentation. I've done a lot of different kinds of testing over the years. I still make my living doing that. Mm -hmm. And and I've I've done a lot of work in the farm industry throughout the years. And so I have some basic understanding of these things more than the average past, you know, person okay. going through it. Mm-hmm. So I decided to put that, you know, that sort of background and expertise to, to, to good here and try to figure out something we could do. Mm-hmm. And about a year, about a year into it or eight or nine months into it, something happened that really brought it together for me. I was starting to understand that there was something very different going on. And yet as I looked around and I talked to people, I saw that the solutions hadn't evolved. They hadn't really changed. Mm -hmm. And yet something told me something was different. And the moment that it really came, came in early 2019 when I was watching a presentation at a scientific conference 
by a professor from the University of Pittsburgh who I've who I've had um, interaction with since. He's a wonderful, brilliant man, mm-hmm. and he published this uh, chart on drug death in America from t- 1979 to 2014. Now I'm watching this presentation in 2019. Right. So they, they have the advantage of four more years of data that he didn't have. Uh-huh. So he presented this, and I guess at the University of Pittsburgh they have this very, very great, uh, uh, a very uh, exhaustive uh, database of death in America. Mm-hmm. So he mined this data for drug death in America, and he plots it on a graph. And when he puts up the graph, something very striking about this graph, mm-hmm. and that is how linear it is. So if you look at drug death from 1979 to 2014, mm-hmm. and he's presenting this in 2015 with 2014 data, mm-hmm. It's linear. It just, you know, linear is on a chart, yeah, right? Yeah. For every for every line you move in X, you move one in Y, and it's right. basically a diagonal up the screen, right? Yes. And so you're saying this is a very linear line. Well, that's really interesting. This is a pretty arbitrary set of data. Drug death mm-hmm. is a pretty disparate um, sort of unrelated uh, bunch of data to come out at this perfectly linear plot, which, by the way, does not plot to population. So why is it so linear? We don't really know. And so so the doctor's presentation said, when something's that linear for that many years with that much data, Mm. you can pretty well believe that there's something below the surface making it linear that we don't really understand, but you can more or less accept that it's linear. Now, when you're saying it's linear, Michael, um, in other words, it's not a lot of peaks and valleys. It's constant no, it's it pretty just, much the it stagnant. grows at this constant over time okay it just grows at this constant rate right it always grows okay. every year is bigger than last year mm-hmm. but but as you say there are no peaks it no, doesn't no go major two spikes in one year yeah. and it doesn't drop the next year right. and then go 2x again the next year none of that yeah. it just keeps on marching upward mm-hmm. and the first thing you would say is oh well it's just growing with population but it doesn't work it doesn't work when you try to do that math mm-hmm. so why is it we don't really know but the interesting thing, remember now, I'll say again, I'm watching this with four extra years of data that he didn't have. So right. he plots this thing out and he says, well, if you want to know what's going to happen in the future of something that's 50 years of millions of data points linear, just continue the slope. Mm-hmm. And then take the slope out to a year in the future, drop down, look at the data, and there's your prediction. And it'll be right. Right, right. So he says the phrase, he goes out to 2018 and he gives the number. And he says, I'll give you two to one odds. I'll give you three to one odds. That's what's going to happen in 2018. Now, I'm watching this in 2019. I knew the Mm. 2018 data. Yeah. He was off by 45%. Wow. Why? Why was he so wrong? Mm -hmm. And I'm watching this, and I'm thinking to myself. So I did a little study, Mark. Mm -hmm. I took his slide, and I recreated it into something I could work with, Mm -hmm. and I plotted it on that very linear graph from 79 to 2014. Mm Mm-hmm. Then I took the, then all I did was take the actual data from 1979 to 2020 right. or 2018. Mm-hmm. And I plot it right on top. And what you see, of course, is my line gets buried into his line from mm-hmm. 1979 to 2014. But mm-hmm. in 2014 exactly, the thing turns upward at a whole new slope and starts ramping higher forward. That's what I thought, yeah. So now when I looked at that and I saw what came out on the screen as I was plotting this out, and I said to myself, that is a paradigm shift. And I thought to myself, if I were to challenge the professor and say, hey, you said back in 2015 this was going to happen in 2018. You gave me two to one odds, three to one odds. Yeah. You were wrong. He would say to me, well, of course I gave that prediction presuming the paradigm didn't change. Yeah, presuming See, there's a thing called the, didn't come in. Yeah. Well, there's a thing called a paradigm shift, Mark. Right. And the, the, the physicist Thomas Kuhn introduces this term in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And what he says about that is, he says that a paradigm, when a paradigm shifts, when we get the, a new dominant paradigm, he says that everything we assumed in an old paradigm, nothing operates in the norms of science anymore. In other words, mm-hmm. all your science is now quote, rendered incompatible with the new phenomena, yeah. facilitating the adoption of a new theory or paradigm. Yeah, so I thought to myself, when I looked at how that line kinked upward, I said to myself, that's a paradigm shift. 
I'm pretty sure I saw that. You were doing a presentation I saw online somewhere. Would you like to reference yes. that, Michael, so somebody could have a, a visual of it? Yeah, they can. Yeah, so so they can. Um, I have it on my website. If you look at my at my website, actus.org, A-C-T-U-S dot org, okay. Okay. you can see that graphic. And it's very, very clear. Yes. And what you'll see is not only is that upward part of the line a paradigm shift, but the other implication is that the difference between the, you know, the, 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 the sloped out line at the same level, and we have to presume that death is still going at that rate. Right. But now this new line above it makes this extra population of death. So I said two things to myself. One, that's a paradigm shift. And mm-hmm. two, that's a definable population. Right. It's different. Mm-hmm. Right. It's the, it's the death of the new paradigm. Well, there's probably the old paradigm still out there, too, and they're probably still dying sure. in the old paradigm. Right. But this extra space caused by this new slope of a line between that and what is the continued slope of the linear line, th- that new population is definable. So as I went about and I talked to people and I did my research, I found out that, yeah, we can easily define the paradigm. It's 2013 fentanyl from China. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. Mm-hmm. That paradigm shift was the introduction of Chinese fentanyl in a massive way in 2013. Wow. Now, if, if, if we had a couple of hours to do on this podcast, I, I would go <laughs> through all the chapter and verse on how we got to that 2013 China fentanyl. But trust me, yes. it is documentable and it is fact. Yes. And, and I use a lot of Sam Quinones' data to build up that story, by okay. the way. Uh, there, there are three converging uh, themes or a perfect storm of three conditions. One of mm-hmm. those conditions I learned from Sam in his book, so everybody mm-hmm. should read it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now 2013 fentanyl from China, that's the moment of the paradigm shift, okay? Okay. And what is the population? Here it is. The population are the people not suffering substance use disorder. Mm-hmm. And what do I mean by that? You see... Until fentanyl came in this new paradigm, opioid, heroin, okay, for the most part, mm-hmm. heroin was, street opioid was heroin, and then, of right. course, you had the semi-synthetics, the pills right. that were, you know, in, in, in involved in that, too. But right. if you take all of that stuff, your Vicodins and your Percocets and your Oxys and, and your street op, 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 uh, uh, heroin, mm-hmm. that was your opioid problem, right. right? Now, that was a one-dimensional killer. Mm-hmm. It killed addicts. For the most part. Right. It killed addicts. It killed right. people with substance use disorder. Mm-hmm. And how does an addict die? Really in one of three ways, but they're all related. Mm-hmm. Number one, uh, and, and some medical examiners tell me the most common way, actually, m- m- many people would be surprised to hear, is not overdose. The most common way is that long-term chronic street drug use is very, very unhealthy. Right? right, you're using drugs mixed by God knows who and God knows what condition. Yes, you're putting them in solution, putting them into mm. often dirty needles, and then mm-hmm. shooting those into your veins. This is a very, very unhealthy activity, mm-hmm. and that and that these long-term chronic drug users develop all sorts of weird diseases. This one, right. uh, the medical examiner from Washington was telling me there's a certain heart disease they get that's that's almost unseen in anybody but drug chronic drug users. Wow. Okay, that's, some would argue that's the most common way they die, but mm-hmm. that was a typical way for them to die. The other is that after, you know, eight or ten years of constant drug use, their survival instinct is so sapped, and they're desperate to get that high that, as you know, an addict doesn't get, mm-hmm. right? An mm-hmm. addict only uses not to get sick, but they still chase the high from that first time they use. Yeah. And so one day, they're desperate for the high so much that they take more than they know they should take. Mm-hmm. They took too much, they got high, and then they died. Yeah. It's another way they die, overdose. Right? Mm-hmm. And a third way is they come out of a rehab, right? 21-day rehab, which right. is a joke in America, right? 21-day yes, rehab yeah, to, most chronic, to most chronic addicts is you and me skipping lunch because we're going to have a great dinner, right? It's really just <laughs> to dry myself out so uh-huh. I can feel the high again. Yeah. So what they do is they go back to what they used to take 22 days ago. That's the right. resistance is lowered, and they die. So, again, yeah. all three types of deaths, very, very highly related, very linear. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. It's opioid grabbing hold of that person, getting them sucked into an addiction pattern of substance use disorder. And then the person goes through a relapse recovery a handful of times. And then one day they die in one of those three manners. Very one mm-hmm. dimensional. Mm-hmm. Now, in comes fentanyl. Think about this a minute. Yeah. Every one of those addicts, where did they start? 
They started at parties taking pills, mm-hmm. or they started on a, on a prescription. But so many of them right. started as partiers as kids, right? Mm-hmm. Well, now you introduce fentanyl into the overall opioid supply stream, and that death starts reaching back deeper and deeper in. Mm-hmm. The addict, by the way, those, those three kinds of deaths I just described, the statistical mm-hmm. average for that was eight years. Wow. That was eight years of recovery relapse, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. eight years to help that person. And it, what did you say just a moment ago? You don't know when the light bulb is going to go off. Right. The average kid who's clean probably had 20 times of relapse and recovery. Mm-hmm. And the average kid who's dead, the same. Mm-hmm. You don't know when that right one's going to come. Maybe it's right. the first. Maybe it's very rarely, if ever, the first. It's the nth. Mm-hmm. And what is the nth? The sixth or the tenth or the twentieth or the thirtieth. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Fentanyl takes all that away because right. it kills so quickly. So the new paradigm is this. Fentanyl took the opioid problem from one dimension and let it start moving in three dimensions and killing mm. all sorts of new populations. And what do I mean by killing new populations? These are populations that existed before. So think about this a minute. Mm-hmm. My daughter had mental illness. She went to self-medicate. Mm-hmm. People have been doing this forever. Right. Mentally, mentally ill people who couldn't afford the meds through the system go on the street and buy drugs all the time. They use marijuana mm-hmm. or they use opioid or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's been going on forever. The difference is until 2013 in the new paradigm, they didn't die. Yeah. If my daughter did exactly what she did in the exact manner she did it on January 11th of 2018, mm-hmm. and the conditions were old paradigm, she would have gotten a bag of diacetylmorphine, she would have taken it, she would have knocked down her symptoms, the next day she'd be fine. Mm-hmm. Now, was she going to keep using enough to get herself addicting? Who knows? Yeah, it's possible, but yeah. But, but yeah. she wouldn't have died that day. Right. right. Okay? Right. Now, I'll give you some other examples. I've got now five examples of athletes who took a Percocet pill because of an athletic injury. Mm-hmm. One or two or three pills that somebody gave them to get through a workout or a practice. Yeah. We're not talking about a chronic use situation. Exactly. Five of these guys dead. Wow. Because the Percocet wasn't real. It had fentanyl in it, and it killed them. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. I've got a, a good friend, Eddie Kobilis, one of my partners, his son, Eddie. Mm-hmm. As far as we know, first time the kid ever took a pill in his life, it was an innocent Xanax. One bar of Xanax, one bar of Xanax isn't going to hurt anybody. He's wow. dead. Because wow. it was a fake Xanax with fentanyl in it. Okay? Yeah. None of those examples I just gave you from my daughter, and you'll hear the story, the other story is Tiffany, Virginia's daughter. I'll let her tell that story. That's right. And that's another new paradigm death. Yep. My daughter, or Eddie, Mm-hmm. Or Malik Noshi or any of these other athletes I'm talking about. Jared mm-hmm. Rome, whose mother is a dear friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Guy was six foot one, three twenty. Wow. A gorilla of a man, a discus wow. thrower, national champion, two time Olympian, one Percocet pill. So wow. he's dead. Wow. Okay. All of these are what I call new paradigm death because every one of those situations fits the description I gave you for my daughter. Mm. If they did what they did before the new paradigm, mm-hmm. they'd be alive today. So that's what I mean about this new paradigm moves in three dimensions. You know who the latest the latest dimension it's reached out to? Cocaine users. Yes, because I've heard. for whatever reason, the, mm-hmm. the Mexican drug cartels have decided to start putting fentanyl into their cocaine, mm-hmm. and now you've got people dying from cocaine yeah. from over who yeah. overdoses on cocaine. Right. That's right. another new population wow. that fentanyl is bringing death to. So, so that's what I mean about this new paradigm. Okay? Yeah, and we still have, of course, the old paradigm, which was and is yes. bad enough, combined yes. with this new paradigm, COVID-19. And, man, we got a battle on our hands. Michael, we're going to take a, about a two-minute break. And okay. um, when we come back, we have uh, lots more to talk about. And you have uh, one of your points here. What does this mean and what can we do? Should we pick it up there? Sure. Okay. We'll be right back. Besides my involvement in product recovery, I'm also in the construction business. I say that to say this. When we have tropical storms or hurricanes, the real hard, difficult, expensive, and dangerous work is usually the result of trees falling on homes or other personal property. Hurricane season is not the only time to get prepared for this. As a matter of fact, it's before and after hurricane season that you need to get prepared. My son Chris started his tree business called Climb Pro Expert Tree Care after Hurricane Florence. Chris has all the equipment and manpower to take on even the most challenging jobs. 
With over 20 years of combined experience, KleinPro LLC can safely remove any unwanted hazardous trees from your property. They also offer tree pruning, elevation, deadwood removal, and other expert tree care services. Don't wait until you have a tree emergency. Visit KleinPro.com, that's Klein with a K. Check them out on Facebook or call Chris Markley at 910-540-5249. Mention this ad for a 10% discount. Chris Baines and his team at Coldwell Banker Seacoast Advantage have been helping folks buy and sell homes and land in the area for over 20 years. With the support of a team, their clients enjoy the highest levels of success, communication, and protection. Sellers will have their properties exposed to the most people to ensure the highest sales price. The marketing they use is designed to thoroughly expose the property with virtual walkthroughs and aerial drone shots. All of this is done for maximum exposure, but to also reduce the in-person traffic in these times of COVID. Home purchasers will have an attentive agent that focuses on their needs and helps locate properties quickly to avoid missing out as we are in such a hot market right now. Additionally, they represent buyers that decide to purchase new construction as the on-site agents represent the builder. Chris Baines and his team know how to listen, and just as importantly, know how to negotiate for the best interests of their clients. With a consultative approach, you can be sure they will look out for the best interests of their clients or why the vast majority of their business comes from past clients and their referrals. Check out their reviews on Zillow, Google, and Facebook. You can reach their team at 910-333-2300 or check out their website at wilmingtonareareastate.com. Light the music, TK. Thank you very much, sir. And welcome back to Recovering Hope. My name is Mark Markley. We're going to continue uh, our discussion with Michael Gray and to try to wrap our heads around this new paradigm. I hope you've been listening. The old paradigm was and is serious enough when it was just the traditional opioid drugs and now the introduction of fentanyl, how this has all changed. Michael, thank you so much for explaining that the way that you did, and, and let's move on to, uh, to take an action. Mark, if I may just go back uh, for one minute sure. um, to, to, to step in. I, I like to make sure that everybody learns something uh, tangible before they leave. Absolutely. So let me just take, take a quick 30 seconds, 60 seconds to overview what is fentanyl. And why is it so bad? Okay. So good. fentanyl is, is what we call a synthetic drug, a synthetic version of morphine. Mm-hmm. Morphine is extracted from the poppy plant, and we know it in, in, in all different forms. We, mm-hmm. we you know different kinds of pain relievers. Right. 19, in 1959, there was a, a chemical invented by a European scientist, uh, Janssen, called fentanyl. And what it was was it was a synthetic version. So what do we mm-hmm. mean by synthetic? It means it's man-made. It means right. that the chemical doesn't exist in nature. Mm-hmm. And we can take various other kinds of chemicals and put them through different reactions that, mm-hmm. we, that we as humans have learned how to do. And we can make these chemicals that don't exist in nature, and they can be very, very helpful to us. We love synthetics. Yeah. In fact, no one loves synthetics more than the pharma industry because instead of having to you know, find things in nature that can right. be in weird places and mm. be things that nobody wants to destroy to get these drugs out of them, mm. we can make as much as we want on demand. So it's mm-hmm. a wonderful thing. The other thing is once we have a synthetic made, we made the molecule ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, things like morphine are made by God. They are what they are, and mm-hmm. we just do with them what we can. Mm-hmm. But once we've made the molecule, we can adjust it, and we can tweak it, and we can do special things with it. Right. So the intrinsic uh, uh, benefits of fentanyl are enormous. This is a fantastic drug mm-hmm. that, is, uh, that is really life-changing for people who really need it. Right. It's a wonderful pain medication. But there's, it clearly has an addictive property to it, yes. and we just have to be careful. Right. And if we get around, we'll talk about that at, at, toward the end, as you s- suggested we might. Okay. What I want to get to people is that this is a synthetic drug. It's mm-hmm. man-made, which mm-hmm. means we can make as much as we want. Right. That's great for the medical community, yes. but it's really bad in the hands of the drug traffickers right. who just can make as much as they want and then pump as much as they want onto the streets. Mm-hmm. The other thing you may have heard of is there are two medical advantages of 
of, of, of fentanyl, which become major uh, life-threatening disadvantages on the street, and that is it's much stronger than natural morphines, mm-hmm. typically 100 times, but it can be depending on the typ- typical, the specific chemical, mm-hmm. as much as 10,000 times stronger. Right. And it metabolizes much faster, which is great for the doctors because the effects kick in much faster and mm-hmm. you recover much faster. Okay. But when you put that into the street, You've now got something that's so potent that the dealer can't mix it safely, which means that a portion is always going to be lethal, and mm-hmm. it metabolizes so fast there's no warning and there's no time for your Narcan. Mm-hmm. So just a little background to why it's yeah, so bad. Important. You've heard this terrible yeah. word, and people hear right, this terrible thing, right. and do people really understand what it is? Okay, mm-hmm. Now it's a simple white powder that looks just like heroin, and they mix it in with the cutting agents. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows the mm-hmm. difference. Okay, mm-hmm. so what you think you're taking is a couple of hundred milligrams, which is a bunch of cutting agent with a fair amount of heroin in it. And mm-hmm. when it turns out that, you know, you're talking about depending on the on the analog of it, you know, it could be, you know, three grains of salt in that bag gets you high and, you know, 10 grains kills you. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in, a, in a bag of, of several hundred milligrams. Right. And so these it's bags, very, very dangerous. And these bags are not mixed in a pharmaceutical no. environment no. with trained no, they're not. chemists. Right. And I'll just say, for something like fentanyl that doses out at microgram level, mm-hmm. it starts at about 25 microgram mm. and, and, and has a 2 micron particle size, pharma, pharma, big pharma, would consider that a very challenging pill to make, mm-hmm. a very challenging pill. If they've got to put 50 micrograms into a tablet of a particle that's that small, they would consider that, with all their PhDs around, they would mm. consider that very challenging. Your drug dealer has no chance but to kill people. Wow. So that's what fentanyl is. That's why it's okay, so Okay, good explanation. Thank you. So you were talking about what does this mean and what can we do, right? Right, right. So what does the new paradigm really mean? Well, the new paradigm death and old paradigm death, I want to introduce a word to everybody. The word that we used to use a lot in my, my school, I studied philosophy, was the term agency, mm-hmm. right? Agency is a... Is, is, is a term that means the literal effect I have on something. It doesn't take into account any judgments or any kind of quali- qualitative statements, uh-huh. just the literal effect I have on something. Mm-hmm. So if you think about those three ways that the, that the substance use disorder sufferer died in the old paradigm, that was a high agency death. The victim had All high right. agency in their death. They had, right. a lot of, they had a big hand in it. Now, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we know they're under substance use, so we're not blaming them. I mean, right. they don't have a lot of control over what they do, and, and, and they're in right. the grip of a disease. Mm-hmm. But, but in a literal sense, high agency. When you talk yes. about that kid who thought they were taking a Xanax pill that their friend said, and I'm doing air quotes, I have a mm. prescription, yeah. and it came out of an amber bottle. Mm-hmm. Well, every drug, every drug addict has a bunch of amber bottles. Right. And who's, who, would their prescription come from CVS or came from the guy down the street, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And when that kid takes that Xanax pill and gets killed, that's a very low agency death. Right. My, my buddy, Eddie Kobilis, his son didn't want to die. Mm. If I would have been standing next to Eddie at the time and said, Eddie, you know, there's probably fentanyl on that pill and it might kill you, that kid wouldn't have taken that pill in a million years. Mm-hmm. But he took it because he trusted it with his Xanax pill and it killed him. Wow. You see, low mm. agency. Right. So forget about who's to blame and not blame. Mm-hmm. There's high agency, low agency. And if we don't begin to address these low agency debts that are more passive, mm-hmm. we don't put programs on to start figuring out how to help these kids. The, the rates are going up and up. Think about it. Mm. Let me revisit what I just said to you from a county in California. Yeah. The number for 2020 is, is bigger than the whole number from 2014 to 2019, and it's going to double this year. Wow. I can't this wrap my head around This is the low agency. Mm. So who are these kids? They're partiers. Kids yeah. just fooling around. Yeah. Right. Kids who had that third beer, and they right. somebody gave them a pill, and they said, ah, what the heck? Right, right. Okay? These people didn't die before the new paradigm. Mm-hmm. They used that pill that once or twice. I, I say to kids sometimes, you know, your big brothers and sisters go into the frat party, snort all the powder they want, take whatever pills they wanted. Worst case, they're going to grow up, wake up with a bad hangover and a guilty conscience. Yeah. You, you'll die. Yeah. It's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. You can't do it. So this high agency, low agency is an outgrowth of the paradigm. Right? We have to understand how people are using and how they're dying if we have any hope to help the problem. Mm-hmm. But I have to tell you, Mark, I, I deal with all these different agencies all around the country, and nobody is accounting for the new paradigm. Mm. So I look at it this way. Think about it. When I, take, when I say the opioid crisis, people think rehabs, treatment, 
medically assisted, you know, right. maybe needle exchange, harm reduction type, all the, yeah. but not one of those things touches my daughter, Eddie Kobilis, mm. you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or any Virginia's, of those athletes yeah. I talked about, right. or Tiffany, or any of them, okay? Yeah. Right. None of those things touch those kids. Right. Or, of course, you know, you know, you know Matt Capilouto and his daughter yes. Alex wasn't going to help her. Right. Or, right. You know, so if you look around at our partners and all their kids who died, mm-hmm. they died in this new paradigm, low agency death, and no one is doing anything to stop it. Oh, yes, they are. Why? Not because we don't want to, because mm. we don't understand it. Yeah. And that's what our mission is all about. So, you know, I have this thing called the Actus Foundation. Mm-hmm. That's what I started in my daughter's name. But mm-hmm. my, and my wife and I, are, you know, a lot of what we do is spiritual as well. We mm-hmm. are devout Roman Catholics, mm-hmm. and of course we believe our daughter now is a saint in heaven, mm-hmm. and we have a lot of proof to that effect. And a lot of what I do in my foundation is that. But I wanted yeah, to have yeah. a foundation where people who aren't as religious as I was might mm-hmm. want to join up and talk about fentanyl, right? Right. So I got together with some other people, you know, you, know, you, you met Matt Capilouto, you met right. Virginia, yes. and, 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 and Steve Filson, and, and Jaime Puerta, and, and uh, Jen Krieger, mm-hmm. and we all formed this thing called the Fentanyl Awareness Coalition, mm-hmm. and what we're trying to do is gather together that 10 or 20 percent common voice of everybody whose kid died from this fentanyl scourge, mm-hmm. you know, what I call the new paradigm. Mm-hmm. And our new paradigm, by the way, it's not just You know, it's not this bifurcation of addicts and non-addicts. One of our partners, Jim Rao, who's doing fantastic work uh, out of Akron, Ohio, on on the Families Against Fentanyl, trying Mm -hmm. to get this thing characterized as a weapon of mass destruction. And and, Mm -hmm. and Jim's a guy, you know, you and I have talked. I want to see him on your program, given out what he's doing on on this uh, this, uh, 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 weapons of mass destruction. Jim's doing great work. But his son was a longtime heroin addict Uh who, who, again, you want to talk about a new paradigm death. He had managed to to work this in, and he knew how to use without getting killed for years. Uh-huh. And then he was going, to, as, as I recall the story, he was going into uh, in, into rehab, and mm-hmm. the parents went out to mass on a Sunday morning. They were coming home to bring to bring their son to rehab, and this was the time. This was going to be it. He was going to get it, and you know all about yeah. this, Mark. This yeah. was the time, yeah. and maybe it was the time. Right. I hope right. I, I, I would have hoped it was the time. I've yes. been praying for him. Mm-hmm. This was the time. But mm-hmm. what did he say? I'm going to get one last taste. Because mm-hmm. this is the last time. Because right. I'm never using this again. Right. Well, his dealer wasn't around. He had to go to somebody else. Mm. What did he get? A bag of fentanyl. He got oh, killed. Oh wow! Oh my that, god! That to me is a new paradigm death. Man, because, yes, it is. Because Tom Rao should have had another day. He should have been in that rehab. So what? He took another bag of heroin. Mm-hmm. He should have been in that rehab. Mm-hmm. Right? But he didn't get a chance. So wow. when I look at all of those things, all of these new paradigm deaths, no one is working to solve those. More rehabs, more medically assisted treatment, you know, more needle exchanges, more, yeah. more Narcan. You know, it's not helping those kids. Right. They don't even know to carry Narcan. They don't even know where to get it. Mm-hmm. There's just some kid who went to a party and took a pill. Yeah. And like you said, or you don't have medi- that or, time to administer the Narcan no. in those cases. So one mm-hmm. of those good suggestions was your SB 350, which thank you for putting that on the air and bringing all the attention to it. Of sure. course, it didn't get out of committee, right. but that's not the end of the world. That's we'll keep right. at it. That's but right. that was a good idea, mm-hmm. right? That was a good idea toward the new paradigm, right? Because mm-hmm. now you start putting some some real uh, 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 penalty onto the dealer because mm-hmm. of the death that occurs. And what society is doing is recognizing the expansion of death. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's, this isn't just drug dealing anymore. This is killing people yes. at a very, very high rate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I make that connection to drunk driving because the SB 350 is, is, is a parallel to a drunk driving statute. That's where right. They put the, the caught drunk driver on notice that if you do this again and you kill somebody, this notice from the court will become your your intent in a, in a murder trial. Right. And now they want to do the same for the drug dealer. Right. And I think that's a wonder. I think that's a wonderful way to do it. You know, because everybody says, well, the guy's just selling a bag of drugs. Okay, mm. first time. Right. Next time, you've been told. Now, yes, now we're going right. to treat you as a murderer. That's right. So we're going to try to get this kind of thinking in other states as well. We have 28 mm-hmm. states in the country that have some kind of a statute of drug delivery resulting in death, which yes. is what they call it in Pennsylvania, where mm-hmm. my daughter died. Mm-hmm. And, that, and, and, and the person who sold her the drugs was convicted under of three felony counts under that law. Mm-hmm. So... That, you know, so we're looking for those ideas to spread out around the country. Exactly. And what we want to do with our foundation is get that 10 or 20 percent voice who wants to push for these kinds of solutions, bring them all together. And 80 percent of what they do is what they do. They do their other stuff. 
Yes. But that 20% where we're the common voice. Yeah. And so anybody listening tonight who's lost a child in the opioid crisis to mm-hmm. fentanyl under what, what you would have heard me describe as a new paradigm, mm-hmm. you can reach out to us at actus.org or uh, or we don't, we'll have our, our FAC website up very, very soon. It's not up yet, but you can reach out to myself at mgray at actus, uh, uh, actus.org. And actus and, and, and is the, A-C-T-U-S, correct? Dot org, yes. yes. And, and, and you can either go to that web domain or mm-hmm. my email if you want to write me is mgray, M-G-R-A-Y, at actus.org. And join up yeah. and help us bring your voice to this to this uh, to this uh, uh, effort. Yes, okay? and, and this is exactly what I saw um, when I saw a, a, a message that Virginia and I had uh, over a month ago, and it was exactly what I was thinking. You know, I find myself doing all of these interviews and and realizing that so many people are doing so many good things um, to fight this battle, but I have a feeling, as you realize, also there's a lot of duplicitous work going on. And, and, and that there needs to be some kind of an organization that's overseeing this or, or gathering the information and, and, and making the voices heard, like Dan, uh, Dan Schneider's Tunnel of Hope. You know, he's trying to get, because there's power in numbers. And the way Virginia explained that and then realized that she's working with you, which is why we're having this conversation, and Virginia is following up uh, next week. Um, and we've, yes, got, we've got about uh, three minutes here, Michael, if you have enough time to wrap up. And I, I do have a couple of short paragraphs here that uh, Virginia, I think I saw it on a post that I wanted to share to give people a, a little bit of an understanding of what's coming up. But um, well, I think you did an I excellent may, job here. Go ahead. If I may, there's one thing I would like to hit, and you yes. talked about some of, uh, some of the nefarious purpose that's out there. So yeah. there's something, I'm using the term, I'm coining the term, mm-hmm. called extreme harm reduction. Mm-hmm. Look, we all want to help this problem. Some of us lean left politically. Some of us lean right politically. Some yeah. of us love Donald Trump. Some of us think that Joe Biden's going to be the answer. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether it's Regina LaBelle is the greatest thing or Jim Carroll, too bad he's got... Oh, we, we all go in our political views. Yes. But we all share a desire to solve the problem. That's right. But in this issue, there, are, there is a group of people who are not out to help anybody. There is a political ideology that they're after, mm-hmm. an ideological victory, and that is called legalization of drugs or the safe shooting zones. Yeah. When you get into safe shootings under legalization of drugs, mm. you are into what I call extreme harm reduction. And extreme harm reduction isn't out to help anybody. It's out for a political, ideological win. Mm-hmm. Okay? And they don't and, and, and I've met them and I've talked to them. Mm-hmm. They don't care who dies. In fact, yeah. death is good because it helps push their cause. Wow. So just be aware that mm. there is a segment of this act, activism level, uh, mm-hmm. activism out there in mm-hmm. the opioid crisis that is not about solving the problem. I mm-hmm. have dear friends on the left and on the right mm-hmm. and everything in between, mm-hmm. but these are people who are in a totally different plane than us because they're not out to help or solve the problem, but to pass their political ideology of legalized drugs. And that's it. And when you see people talking about safe shooting zones, yeah. you're probably getting into the danger zone. And when you hear mm-hmm. decriminalization, legalization, you know what you're talking mm-hmm. about. They don't want to help mm-hmm. nobody. Yeah. And, and, and you need to discount them. Yeah. So I just I, wanted to get that out there. Yeah, I'm trying good. to get this terminology out. Okay? Yeah, very good. Very important. Michael, thank you so much. And um, thank you, I don't know Mark. if you want to stay on while I read this uh, from Virginia real quick here. And this is from next week's oh, guest. Oh, please. My, my pitch for her. Everybody will love her. She is oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. She knows the numbers, and she is, uh, she is right as rain. She is. And this is from Virginia. Many people like to blame the victim, and they may say something along the lines of, well, they chose to use an illicit drug. Or, well, they should have known that drugs were dangerous. So when, it, when that comes up, here is what I do. Before they even finish that sentence, I interrupt and very loudly say, no, my child did not make a choice to use illicit fentanyl. That was stolen from her when someone, the, that, yeah, that choice was stolen from her when someone very deliberately made illicit fentanyl look like a name brand Percocet to deceive my child into consuming it and she was killed. This is a poisoning, not a choice, and it's a homicide, not an overdose. It does not matter how they got it or where it was in. Putting a deadly substance into anything a person consumes without their knowledge is a poisoning, and if they die from it, it's a homicide. I hope this helps every parent out there who struggles with what to say when faced with this. 
Be bold and never be afraid to speak out your truth. And believe me when I say that person will never make the mistake of mislabeling, mislabeling your loss again. And you will have taught someone what this epidemic really is. So that's Virginia coming up next week and um, works very closely with Michael and many others doing a great job fighting the good fight. And again, Michael, thank you so much for your time and energy thank and, you, and everything that you've put into this. You're doing, you're doing a good thing. So when you say that nobody's right. talking about this, nobody's fighting it, yes, we are, sir. <laughs> we are. Thank you very much. God bless you, thank you. God bless your family, Mark. You too. Thank you very much. And speaking of blessing my family, if I have a few seconds, I would ask for prayers for my son, Dylan. He's having a hernia operation tomorrow and just wishing a successful procedure and speedy recovery. Thank you and happy Easter. Bringing you the best local talk radio shows, Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7 FM, WFBT, Carolina Beach. You wanted to see me? Yes, please, have a seat. So here's the thing. When this